at the North Central Research Center in Minot. Uh, previously, Chris was in the position that Mary and I are now doing, so he's got a pretty wide, wide array of knowledge to share with you guys today, but um, I'll let Chris take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm the soil health specialist now over at the North Central Research Extension Center in Minot. And I'm going to talk about some of those things that improve with the soil with the addition of, of manures and composts. Um, who here has seen the Simpsons movie? Anyways, the premise of the movie is Homer gets his pig. And he has this big uh, silo full of pig crap. And they clean up Lake Springfield and because Homer wants to get a donut, he doesn't take care of the manure properly. And so after they cleaned up Lake Springfield, the, the lake, the pollution just went back. And so it's, th th that's the, the starting of the movie anyways. And it's important that we manage our manure properly so that we don't have adverse effects. We want to keep Lake Springfield clean. So what exactly is soil? Well, it's made up a handful of different things. 50% of that soil is generally going to be pore space. And under ideal conditions, 25% of that pore space is going to have water in it. 25% of that, of that pore space, or I shouldn't say 25%, but half of that pore space is going to have water, half of it's going to have air. Now if you're up in the mined uh, area like we are, um, being really wet right now, there ain't much air, there's a lot of water in there. But then 45% of that soil is composed of minerals, the rocks, the material that the soil is formed from. And then we have this little sliver here of our soil, and that's generally going to be somewhere around 5% organic matter. Now these are numbers prior to uh, today's farm, when we went out and started tilling up our fields and that, we started reducing organic matter. A lot of soil samples in the, in the Carrington vicinity is going to probably have somewhere around 3% organic matter. You get out in western North Dakota, I've seen organic matters levels as low as 1, maybe in the Red River Valley some of that stuff is going to be somewhere around 4%. Anyways, this is a tiny sliver, but it has one of the greatest impacts or biggest impacts on the quality of that soil. And so this is kind of what the carbon cycle looks like. You know, we got a lot of exchanges of CO2 and carbon going on in the ocean, and we're going to focus on our terrestrial uh, carbon cycle. But we get photosynthesis going on, the trees take up some CO2, they make biomass, and they release oxygen. And so some of that stuff with the trees and plants, they sequester that in the soil. And so that's, and as that stuff dies, uh, that's where we get our organic matter with the soil. And we also have all sorts of stuff down there from all the dinosaurs uh, that is, that's now oil that we're mining. But then, like I said, when we till up our soil, we speed up that oxidation process. We increase the temperature and the biological activity of that soil. And so that CO2 or, or that organic matter is lost to the atmosphere in the form of CO2. So this is kind of a diagram then of what that nitrogen cycle is. Um, we have a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere, somewhere around 78%. Some of it gets put into the soil through our legumes. So we get nodules that go on, so things like alfalfa, soybeans, lentils, things of that nature, puts <coughs> nitrogen back in the soil. Well, then we get animals, I should have had a cow there and not a rabbit for a day, <laughs> but that eats the food and then it defecates on the soil and so nitrogen gets put in the ground that way. And then when that nitrogen's in the soil in the organic form, it has to mineralize or become plant available. Plant's job is to take up these inorganic minerals and turn them into organic compounds. So the stuff when these dead plants die and when, uh, when the animal defecates, Plants can't get that yet. They got they got to get that to the soil, and we have these bacteria and these fungi. They eat this organic stuff, and as they die, or they or and they can also change the organic form into different forms of nitrogen. Usually, our first step with making plant available nitrogen is ammonium, NH4 plus one. That's a readily plant available um, nitrogen, and then it moves over to nitrite. That's a really fast uh, reaction. It doesn't stay nitrite very long, but with our nitrosomous bacteria, they turn that into nitrate. And that's what a lot of our nitrogen is in the soil. It's plant available, uh, but it's also, uh, that's the form of nitrogen that is also 
a soluble in the water, it can't be leached. And so that can go back into the plant and then under uh, anaerobic conditions where we have saturated soils, uh, the nitrogen usually has one or two pathways to go. One, it can be denitrified and lost to the atmosphere. The other one, it moves down deeper into that soil. So that's a quick rundown of what the nitrogen cycle is. But with manure, when we put that on the ground, there's a lot of organic matter there. And so it improves a lot of our soil properties. Uh, it can increase, uh, so first thing it does is it, it'll increase soil organic matter. But with that, it can decrease bulk density. Bulk density is the measurement of the, of the, the weight of the soil divided by its volume. And so it gives us an idea of is that soil compacted or not. And the, the reason we don't want compacted soils is water doesn't want to infiltrate, air doesn't want to go down in that soil, and plant, plants have to work a lot harder for that root to go down into the ground and mine those minerals. It can also increase water holding capacity. Organic matter acts a lot like a sponge. And because of that, it can improve the amount of water that uh, the soil is capable of holding. If you're having a drought condition, this can help you greatly. It also reduces evaporation. We all hear about mulching on gardens. Well, we're just throwing on wood chips, stuff like that. That's all organic matter. That's fighting evaporation, keeping that water in the soil so the plants can use it. Then it can also increase water infiltration. So we reduce the, the amount or the intensity of our runoff events. That's, that water has time to go into the soil. Then we can also increase the soil aggregates. Familiar with all sorts of little pieces of soil, but when we have um, the plants, they secrete these glues, like glomalins, and that helps hold the soil together. So instead of having all these little single grains that can be easily lost to evaporation, they form these big soil structures or larger soil structures, and and that allows that increases the soil structure, so the water can move through easier, and we have less erosion. And then the big one is it definitely increases fertility. I'm going to show you guys some of our uh, fertility research in a little bit. Then we also have this thing called cation exchange capacity in the soil. And the soil acts a lot like colloids, like clays, and organic matters have these slight negative charges. And that allows the soil to hold on to plus charge nutrients, such as ammonium at NH4 plus 1. So, Things like that don't get lost as easily, and the plants have an ability to use it. So increasing the organic matter increases the negative charges of that soil, so we can hold on to some of those things. Uh, be wary, it does have a little bit of salt, and I'll show you guys some work that we've done with uh, manure and soil salinity. And uh, when putting the putting manure on the soil, if you're dealing with a clay soil, you're not going to see changes as great as you would on a sandy soil. Here's a couple things to keep in mind. If we imagine an acre of soil, it's about six inches thick, that's going to weigh somewhere around two million pounds. So 1% of organic matter is going to have roughly 20,000 pounds. So if we put on an application, 30 tons of manure, so we're putting on 60,000 pounds, theoretically we're adding somewhere around 2% of organic matter there, but we lose, but only somewhere around 50 or 60% of that manure is going to be is going to be organic matter, but we do lose that organic matter throughout the growing season as those, those fertilizers that we get, the N, P, and the K, they change from the organic forms to the inorganic forms. So here's a chart of what we see for a lot of uh, different nutrients in our manures. Um, this is stuff that I've done uh, going out sampling manure all across the state. I know Mary and Emily are still uh, doing that, so I don't know what, what their numbers are right now, but these are the numbers that I had before I left. And if you look at this, we had 142 samples of beef, and um, th these are the averages. We had about 16 pounds of nitrogen, 7 pounds of phosphorus, 14 pounds of potassium. Well, the range was somewhere around 6.7 to 65 pounds of nitrogen. So that's a huge, huge difference. I mean, that could mean the difference between having a good yield or having a bad yield if you don't put on enough. Or it could be the difference between having a nice look, nice looking spring, Lake Springfield or a bad looking Lake Springfield if you don't do that stuff right. So when you see numbers like this, they give us an idea of what to use and how to plan ahead for the next growing season and how much stuff we want to put on. But it's important to go out and sample that manure, sample that compost, and ground truth it so you do it properly. Because you're not going to go pay somebody at the elevator to go out and put 
uh, your, your fertilizer down without knowing exactly how much is in there and what the rate is. And we should do the same thing with our manure. So these are, what, these are some photos of what different applications look like. This is what four tons to the acre looks like. There's a little smattering of manure out there in that wheat stubble. This is what 16 tons to the acre looks like, a little bit more. And this is what 42 tons to the acre looks like. You can hardly see any of the soil there. So there's different ways to calibrate spreaders. I'm not going to talk about that today, but it's important to go out and do some ground truthing, know what's in the, in the manure, and also know how much you're putting out there. So mineralization management. We put the manure on is predominantly in all these organic forms. The nitrogen's there, but the plants can't utilize it. So we got these microbes in the soil, bacteria and uh, fungi. They take that organic stuff and make it plant available. There's a couple things to keep in mind with mineralization is that for these bacteria to do their thing, we need some moisture and we also need some heat. Um, if you get a really dry year, you're probably not going to get the see, see the boost in the crop that you would during a, a normal year. If you get a cool year, same thing. And maybe part of it is, well, it wasn't warm enough for the corn this year. But uh, when we've looked at different studies, look at the mineralization, it is temperature and moisture dependent. Every time we increase our, our temperature by 10 degrees, we double the biological activity of, uh, of the soil. So these are what some of the values are when you get those values back, like when I showed you it had 16 pounds of nitrogen per ton. Well, in raw manure, about half of that's going to be plant available. So when you get that number back, divide that by two, that gives you an idea of how much nitrogen is going to be there. Phosphorus, about 80% of that's going to be mineralized. And potassium, about 90% of that's going to be mineralized. Now when we compost, we alter the, we alter the manure. When we have raw manure, we have these simple organic chains, and when we compost, we're facilitating these bacteria and these fungi to, to, spread, to speed up the decomposition process. And so they take these small chains and they make them into these long, complex organic compounds. And because of that, things like nitrogen, we only have 20% available in the compost. It's still there, but it takes longer. There's more work involved in order to make this stuff plant available. Whereas the phosphorus, uh, that's still somewhere around 80% mineralized in potassium. Uh, there's some research that I found somewhere down in, uh, well, I think it was Israel, it was the only place I could find work on, on uh, potassium, but they found about 30% of that was going to be mineralized. So with utilization of compost, uh, this one study I found by Eggball and Power, um, in a conventional tillage system, they found out that about 15% of that nitrogen was going to be mineralized. And they compared that to a no-till system, whereas in the no-till system they found that 20% of that nitrogen is going to be mineralized. They didn't really have any ideas with why that was happening. I thought maybe uh, when you put it on, you put the compost on the soil, it's on a no-till system, it's blacker, maybe that versus a tillage operation. So I don't know exactly if this is a brown soil that we're dealing with or a black soil like we find up here. So I thought maybe that was, that was kind of my idea with why that happened. But with compost, they did find that in a no-till system, we get a little bit more nitrogen from it. Uh, and then the second year, about 8% of that total nitrogen is going to be mineralized. Then the third year, a little bit less. The fourth year, a little bit less from that. <coughs> the thing to keep in mind with compost is a lot of phosphorus and potassium can be released. And phosphorus is, is usually the culprit for an algae bloom. We've got lots of nitrogen in our... We, we, we can have... It, it takes a lot more phosphor, a lot less phosphorus to cause an algae bloom than it does nitrogen. And because of that, we need to keep in mind with what we're doing with the phosphorus in that compost. And because of the amount of phosphorus in the compost versus nitrogen, in a lot of instances, we should probably treat the compost more as a phosphorus fertilizer. So then we put on the compost to meet our phosphorus needs, and then we put on some sort of conventional nitrogen source to meet our nitrogen. Um, we talked a little bit about was that milestone was the chemical you brought up that, that can uh, pass through the animal. I'm not familiar with that one, but uh, some things that I did found, find were about picloram, that's stinger, or excuse me, picloram is torn on, and clopyrrolid, that is stinger. 
Um, those, those chemicals already have a pretty long residual effect after application on the ground, but these two in particular, uh, I found they do pass through a cow digestive system and they aren't deactivated in the composting process. That heat does a lot of things. It can kill weed seeds, it can uh, uh, kill off uh, bacteria like salmonella, things of that nature, but the, these particular chemicals, it didn't really uh, have much of an effect of altering those and things like Tordon, there ain't much stuff that grows out there in Tordon, so if you are feeding some ditch hay to your animals that are composting that, keep in mind that if there was Tordon applied on that field, it could pass through and if you put that on your field, you may have some issues. Chris, I think it's an amino part of it, it's not approved of hay crop ground because of that very reason, because it will... Uh, of milestone? Yeah. Okay. What, what was the name of that again? I think it's a meal part of it, I think it's what it's classification is. Okay. I think milestone just for pasture. Pasture only, it's not for hay, it's because of the ability to... Okay, also, okay, so it stays out there and doesn't come back home and you got all of them in or back home. Okay. So if you do know that you have some, some, uh, it, or if you suspect that some of that stuff might have been gone through a cow and we want to put it out in the field. Uh, SDSU does a lot of chemical testing and you can send a sample down there and they can test it for some of these chemicals. So we have a big cropping systems trial on here in uh, Carrington that was initiated in 1987. Uh, they have a bunch of different things going on with no-till, conventional till, manure amendments, compost amendments, <coughs> different rotations. And um, they looked at four-year rotations that started from 1987 to 1990, and then 1991, 1994, then 95, 90, 99, and so on. And within each of these crops, we have four different nitrogen treatments. There's three tillage systems, no-till, uh, minimum till, and then conventional tillage. So in some of our areas, we had no N applied, about 40 pounds per acre of, of nitrogen, then 80 pounds per acre of nitrogen. And then we also put on some compost manure at 160 pounds to the acre. And that was at the start of each four year cycle. And they didn't put it on the compost after that. So with, with, uh, with that application of the compost, they found no significant differences in yields of crops, regardless of the tillage practice. There was a slight yield difference between nutrient sources and in this particular study, compost out yielded comparable commercial nitrogen fertilizers in most cases. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the difference between our small grains and our later season maturing crops like corn. In 2008 and 2009, we wanted to see what, what happens. We wanted to find out is the spring application better or fall application of manure better on spring. So in 2008 and 2009, we, we set out to, to learn about this. It was a conventional tillage system. We applied 150 pounds of nitrogen from the manure. So we would have actually put on about 300 pounds of total nitrogen to account for that mineralization effect. And we had the spring and fall manure application. Our, uh, we had a check that had just residual soil nitrogen. And we also had, uh, had a conventional nitrogen source from urea. So this is kind of how we go about and do our research project. We have a trailer here with a load cell. We load stuff up on a bucket and we put it out in the wheelbarrow and we go put it out on the 25 by 25 foot plots or so. Uh, we try to get it as uh, uniform of an application as possible. It's probably more uniform than you'll ever get out of a, uh, out of a manure spreader, but this is how we go about it. So we dump it on, we rake it out a little bit, then we go over behind, uh, after the application, we'd go behind it and, and incorporate it either with a, uh, a tandem disc or a field cultivator. So these are how, these are our yields after two years. We had our check, which had no nitrogen, yielded at about 30 bushels, and this is spring wheat. Our urea did out yield everything else at 48 bushels to the acre, followed by the fall manure, which only had 45 bushels, followed by the spring manure, which had 40 bushels. These little letters behind the, the number indicates if they're statistically similar or not. So these two are statistically similar, similar since they both have A's, and the 45 and the 40 are both statistically similar because they have the B's behind. We also look at what the price of the fertilizer was. We have our manure custom haul and applied every year out here in Carrington. And uh, using what the nutrient test result was from that manure and what 
the, the bill was for the haul and the application, we came up with nitrogen out of the manure was about 11 cents a pound, as, as was phosphorus and potassium. Now I also call a couple elevators in the area to see how much their, their MP and K is worth. So anhydrous was somewhere around 46, 47 cents a pound. Urea was somewhere around 55 cents a pound. And phosphorus from 11.52 out was 56, 57 cents a pound. And potash was somewhere around 57 uh, cents a pound. So the manure is a heck of a lot cheaper. Now, a lot of this cost can also be based on how far you're hauling that manure. Our manure happened to be hauled about a mile and a half one way. So that this wasn't too far, but we got it out there on the field, 11 cents a pound for a nutrient, sign me up for that. So did the manure make you money? Well, we had no fertilizer cost with the check. Our fertilizer bill from the urea was $82.5, whereas our manure applications were about $33 an acre. Dollars per bushel at this time was $8.35, uh, the check, we grossed $250 and we netted $250. Uh, the, the, the net was found out by the gross minus the fertilizer cost. Our urea, we grossed the most at $400 a bushel, or excuse me, $400 an acre, but we only netted $318 because we had an $82 nitrogen bill. Now, with our fall manure, we didn't gross as much as we did with the urea. But because there's about $50 difference there in our fertilizer bill, we managed to net another $20 an acre. So that did pay quite a bit. Now with the spring manure, it's a little bit of a different story. We only grossed $334 and our net was $301. So in this instance, the conventional fertilizer did out yield the spring application of the manure. The reason why we think this is, is because that fall manure was put out, was put out a handful of months earlier, six months or so before the spring manure, so it had time to do some more mineralization. We need some heat, we need some moisture, and we need time in order to get these, these fertilizers plant available out of the manures and the composts. So that's what we feel happened. The, the fall manure was just sitting out there a little bit earlier. So in a small grain system, if I was putting manure out, I'd want to put it out in the fall. What months in the fall? Uh, we did this like in October, I believe. And if you could get by with putting it out there in September, you might even see a greater boost as well. But when you're putting manure out there, you want to incorporate it the next day or two afterwards because first thing it smells. So if you got some neighbors around, they probably won't be too happy with you. But the other thing is we sequester a lot of those nutrients because we lose a lot of that nitrogen due to volatilization. And by covering that and tilling it in some, that uh, prevents the loss of nitrogen. Chris, when you do the fall applied, do you see more available phosphorus? Is that when you see the increase in availability of phosphorus? I, I would assume you would a little bit, um, but I haven't seen a study that's compared nitrogen availability and phosphorus availability. Right now we're still trying to get a much greater grasp on what the nitrogen is going or how that nitrogen is going on in the soil. I, I would expect you probably would see a little bit more phosphorus. Has there been a study where it's compost versus manure? From one fertilizer to the next? Yeah, like with this one here. I have seen some. I don't have any on here. Okay. Um, a lot of it depends upon the type of crop, too. Corn usually does really well on these manure and compost applications versus the small grains. Point being is, when you put that manure out there, the small grains need it right away. As soon as that wheat starts coming up, you need phosphorus and nitrogen, so tillers and it's all happy and whatnot. Um, if I've seen corn, it, go, it goes really slow, and once the 4th of July comes along and that heat kicks in, you can almost watch that stuff grow. So, what we think what's going on there is in the corn aspect, that manure's been out there long enough and has, has provided or has the nitrogen ready to go for that corn. When it, when it needs it. And so, like I said, corn tends to do better on manure and, uh, and compost versus that. Now, when it comes to compost versus manure, some of the stuff that we've played with, um, it, it's really tough to go pound for pound of nitrogen and phosphorus of manure versus compost because those ratios of the different nutrients are a little different. Plants generally need somewhere around 10 parts of nitrogen for every part of phosphorus. And manure isn't too far off there when you see 8 pounds per ton of, of uh, 
There's like 16 pounds per ton of nitrogen versus somewhere around 5 or 6 pounds of phosphorus. Now you talk about compost. That, that ratio is a heck of a lot closer. Composted beef, all of a sudden, those numbers are pretty darn close. And so when you start trying to put out just compost versus just manure, it, it gets really tricky. So what we've done in those instances, we've used the compost as a phosphorus source and supplemented that with urea. And we've done just as well, or it's been very comparable. That, that's why we like to use phosphorus in a lot of instances more as a, uh, or compost more as a phosphorus source. Jasper? Yes, Chris, actually we're working on that. We're actually studying the rate at which nitrogen mineralizes on that a composted uh, corn treatment versus the fresh one not treatment. And the results that we're getting is show that uh, if nitrogen is the main problem, then you might know we most often show a better response in the crop. The crop Nitrogen is tending to be the limiting factor with the yes. manure. Yeah. Uh, this is just showing again the uh, a graphical of, a graphic of what the net return is with the fall manure, uh, how much we made from that application versus the urea, twenty-four dollars less versus the spring manure, forty-one dollars less, and with the check we made ninety less dollars without um, applying anything. A couple things to keep in mind: uh, both growing seasons weren't ideal for microbial action. If you remember two thousand eight. Um, 2008 was, was that the cold or the wet one? No, 2008 was, was cold and dry, and 2009 was just dry. So when we're dealing with small grains, we always say that 50% of that nitrogen is mineralized. Well, maybe we should think about assuming like 30% of that nitrogen is mineralized and applying more accordingly based on that. But uh, more research needs to be done in order to come up with some of those numbers. Um, but we do know too that if we apply manure as a phosphorus fertilizer and supplement with a conventional nitrogen source, we do pretty darn good with our crop yields. So what about corn? So that's small grains, it does okay, but corn does a heck of a lot better with uh, manure and compost applications. And like I said before, that's because corn wants its nitrogen later in the growing season. We got some heat, we got some moisture, we got some time to take those organic forms and mineralize them into plant available inorganic forms of nitrogen. I couldn't find the studies, but back when I had my post here, I had a lot, I read a lot of papers that, that compared manure versus conventional fertilizer, and I don't know if I ever found um, a study that compared manure and conventional fertilizer where the conventional fertilizer actually out yielded the manure. They were usually about the same, or the manure was usually just a touch better than the conventional fertilizer. And some of that might be because of the addition of the organic manure. So this is a lot more of what I deal with nowadays is soil quality. This is not a, a soil of high quality. It kind of reminds you of walking around somewhere in Europe with all the, the cobblestone uh, roads and that. And this is taken uh, from North Dakota. So with manure, we know it increases organic matter, it increases biological activity of, uh, of that soil. Um, with this study, this was conducted on a loam soil, so somewhere around 30% clay, 30% uh, sand, 30% silt. Um, the fertilizer had a soluble organic carbon measurement of about 4.2 parts per million, and it really didn't have anything for biomass versus the control. Now with stockpiled manure, so this would be something that we would, um, more like raw manure, those numbers increased greatly. And then when we looked at rotted manure, which they didn't turn it, but when you hear people say that they have compost and it's been a pile that's sitting behind their house for about 10 years and they call it compost, but it hasn't been turned so it really isn't compost. That's kind of more what I got gathered out of what that rotted manure was, uh, that increased uh, the microbial biomass of, of the carbon even more. So I would assume compost would uh, benefit that aspect of the soil even more. So this is a study that I found uh, back, uh, it was published in uh, 1981, and they looked at a clay soil over a loamy soil. 
Uh, so the topsoil was a clay, um, subsoil would have been a loamy soil. They applied manure in uh, 1970, 71, 72, 70, and 73. Um, and this is what the organic matter started out as, we're somewhere around 0.8, 0.9%. This over here is the tons that they applied on different years. So here in the first year of the study, they applied 80 tons of manure. This, this uh, particular uh, treatment had 20 tons one year, 20 tons the next, followed by 20 tons, 40 tons the first year, 40 tons the following years. Uh, this one had 160 tons the first year, nothing. Then they did 80 tons the first year, 160 tons the following year. Then they looked at 80 tons one year, 80 tons the next, and so on. So we applied manure up to 1973. And our organic matter, those numbers are going up, and we'd expect that with the addition of the organic matter to the soil. But over time, those numbers went back down. So with the no manure treatment, they started out in 1970 with 8% organic, or 0.8% organic matter, excuse me, and it went up a little bit, went back down, kind of stayed a little bit level, it increased about 2.2%. Now with the 80 tons that first year, they had a big boost in organic matter, they almost doubled it. But over time again, it went down. Now with the 20 tons and 20 tons and 20 tons, it went up quite a bit to begin with and then it kind of slowed up, but then after they stopped applying the manure, that organic matter still went down. And the same thing with the 40 tons, uh, followed by the 40 tons of manure. <coughs> and they were able to increase the organic matter somewhere around 0.6% with this, which that's a huge difference in the soil when you really think about it on the, on the scheme of things. With 160 tons of manure on that first year, it had a huge bump. They almost, uh, they more than doubled it, but over time it went back down again. They increased it by half a percent though. And the 80 and 160, they went from 1% all the way up to 3%. So we see these benefits with the soil where increasing organic matter is going to do a lot for the soil. But it's still important to apply that manure, apply that compost at agronomic rates. What are the nitrogen demands of your corn? What's the nitrogen, de nitrogen demands of your wheat? And apply accordingly. And over time, these numbers will go up. And this is kind of what everything looks like all piled together. Everything goes up. Everything comes back down. So just because we put manure out there doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay up. This is if we want to increase our organic matter, um, we need to stay on top of it. But we also should think about implementing other things that can increase that organic matter. Cover cropping, reducing your tillage, or going to a no tillage system. Those sorts of practices will also add to the increase of the organic matter. And so here's, uh, th this study looked at different applications of manure. So we got zero tons, 10 tons of the acre, 30 tons, 60 tons, 119 tons. And what happened to our soil? Well, our bulk density went down as we increased our, our manure application, which is great because, because we've got more organic matter in there, the roots are gonna grow easier, water's gonna hold in there better, water's gonna infiltrate, air is gonna move, things of that nature. Well, we also increased our water-stable aggregates. Manure's pretty darn sticky. I, I grew up on a sugar beet and potato farm and didn't work too much with manure until I came out here. I learned about how sticky manure can be. And because of that stickiness, it helps hold that soil together. So that's going to reduce things like, in, uh, like erosion. To give you an idea with that bulk density, um, these are what cultivated soils kind of range from 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter to 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter. If we get a bulk density over 2.5, that's what concrete is. Didn't say what type, what soil texture it was, but when we started, 1.37 bulk density was somewhere over here. So I assume it was probably a high organic soil to begin with. And as we increased our, our uh, application rate, it went down. So now we're down here getting close to that uncultivated soil. We're getting close to that native soil that we know was great 100 years ago. So the manure also affects water infiltration. Um, these are called uh, infiltrometers. This is uh, something that Cornell developed a few years ago, and it's just like a giant pail, and at the base of them are a bunch of little straws, so it kind of simulates raindrops going on in the soil, and we measure uh, how much water we put out in a given time, how much goes into the soil, and how much runs off. 
So our infiltration rate, when we start, when they started out uh, with the manure or with no manure, was 4.1 inches per hour. And as they increase the manure rate, they greatly increased the pond and infiltration rate. And when they got to 40 tons per acre, all of a sudden that soil can soak up 13 and a half inches of, of rain in an hour. This is uh, what the inside of what that infiltrometer looks like. They got these little straws going on, so it kind of makes it rain. And next to it, there's an outlet pipe, and you usually dig a hole a foot or 18 inches over and put a cup in there, so that's how we collect our runoff next to it. And so uh, they also looked at what the pore space was of that soil. And as they increased their manure application, they also increased the total pores. Now, some of these numbers with our smaller pores, 0.3 to 1.12 millimeters, didn't really increase. But our large pores did. Uh, if, if you were to think of a pickup being a water droplet getting from point A to point B being that infiltration of the soil, these smaller pores would be kind of like going down a dirt road, whereas these larger pores, that's kind of like going down interstate. They can go a lot faster down those big holes. We know big culverts move a lot more water than small culverts. And so that had an effect on the soil and so that increased that infiltration. We also did some manure salinity work here at the Carrington Research Extension Center, and that site is uh, it's not being used for manure right now. They got a bunch of different cover crops and alfalfas going on up that way, but this is just east of the pasta plant. Uh, our site was somewhere around here, and I learned that year that if you're going to do a salinity uh, study, you need to be mindful of where that water's coming from and where it's going because we ended up having our stuff flooded out. But we did, we were able to collect some data. The first thing we did is we went out and measured the salinity. We used something called a ferris. It has these discs behind the pickup, and they shoot a little electrical signal down into the soil. And it can measure 0 to 12 inches, what the, what the soil salinity is, and also 0 to 3 feet, what that salinity is. We then have this hooked up to the GPS. You can kind of see the GPS there. There's the Raven Auto Steer in the thing and it's hooked up to a laptop. So as we zigzag across the field, it draws us up a map of what the salinity is across the field. One of the things to keep in mind when you get these numbers back, it gives you an index of what that soil salinity is. So you have to go out and soil sample and actually test with the lab what that salinity is so we can go back out and um, calibrate what that index number is. So this is what the map looked like. Um, our site was way up in the corner here, and we had an EC of somewhere around 3 to 6. A soil is considered saline when that electrical conductance is greater than 4. Now, if your EC is less than 4, you may have some issues with some crops. Soybeans don't do, don't do worth a darn, as do other pulse crops, when you get more than an EC of somewhere around 2. But things like barley, wheat will do okay, sunflowers will do okay. In, uh, in these hot, higher ranges of the EC. And this is what the DBC looked like, the zero to three feet, and the EC was as high as nine up there, but when it's nine, when it's three feet down, we aren't too worried about the, what's going on with the roots. So we thought with the addition of the organic matter that this would, this would uh, buffer what's going on with the salinity. With soil salinity, it kind of tricks that plant into thinking that it's in a drought. Um, Roots need to suck up moisture, they need to suck up nutrients, and that salt in the, soil, in the water has a tendency to fight off that plant's ability to take up the water. So even though we see these saline areas in our lower water areas of the field, it's kind of tricking that plant to thinking that a drought is going on. So this is what we tested with our compost. It had an EC of the manure about three, and, it had, and the compost had an EC of about two, so there's a little bit less. It was kind of basic with the pH, uh, we had 11 pounds of nitrogen per ton in the manure and about 8 pounds with the compost. And our soil tests, uh, 0 to 12 the average, we already had 60 pounds of nitrogen there. Uh, phosphorus, 20 parts per million. Um, and we had plenty of potassium. The pH was already kind of basic. And like I said, we knew that, the, um, that there was some salt issues out there already. So we came up with a couple different treatments. We added compost, we added manure. <coughs> With the compost, we had 13 tons per acre. We call that our light treatment. 
and we had 24 tons per acre, we called that our medium treatment, and we had a heavy treatment of 45 tons to the acre compost. And the manure, again, we went light, that was about 11 tons to the acre, medium 23 tons to the acre, and we went heavy again. We applied all these in the fall to allow uh, maximum mineralization. This occurred after we did that whole uh, fall spring uh, manure timing study. And after we applied the manure and the compost, we incorporated it with a tandem disc. With our plant available nutrient, we applied about 14 pounds of nitrogen, 30 pounds of nitrogen with the compost, and 57 with the heavy. With our manure, 65, 140, 266. We, our yield, we shot for 45 bushels of wheat. We need 52 and a half pounds of nitrogen to the acre. So the medium and the light of the compost was, we, we didn't have enough nitrogen out there and we didn't supplement it either. We needed eight pounds of phosphorus, but we sure met that. And the potassium, we didn't need to add anything, so we had plenty of fertilizer out there, except for these, the slight and the medium treatment of the compost. So we went out, we applied the manure, went out and we incorporated it with the tandem disc, and uh, we went out and did germination counts. This is a one foot by one foot square. We randomly put that down in the field, count how many plants had come. You see all this white stuff, that's the salt. Another picture, not quite as salty. Uh, the wheat looks a little bit better. And so this is what we found out. We planted 1.9 million seeds to the acre, and our establishment of the plants, remember I said this stuff uh, flooded out, so we weren't able to take it to yield, but we were able to get these germination counts. And with our lake compost, we had uh, 600,000 or so uh, were established. The plants, the, the plants that did establish was 31%. The medium, we only had 8%. Um, the heavy, we had 22%. The light, we had 27%. The medium, we had 27%. The heavy, we had 16%. So you can't put on too much compost or manure in some of these areas. There are salts in it, but there is a point where we do see a benefit to the soil and we think it has to do with the water relationship with the increased organic matter. This is what it kind of looks like staggered. Our compost at 13 tons of the acre was the best. Um, 23 tons? I bet they're supposed to be a two in front of there. Um, and the 11 tons of manure and 23 tons of manure did pretty good and then it decreased as we increased our rates of the compost of the manure. The one thing I should, I, I should point out though is this was just a demo strip. We weren't able to replicate it at all. We, we need to redo this research project a few more times in order to really make some, uh, some judgments on it. So this was just a one, a one shot thing. We need, three or, we need to do this three or four more times or have more treatments so we can run some proper statistics on it. But it does indicate that with the application of some compost or some manure, can help uh, establish under germination of your crops in these, some of these saline grounds. So in summary, compost and manure are good fertilizers for soils and the crops. Um, things that are like corn that are later maturing tend to do a little bit better with, with manure versus our early maturing crops. Compost and manure enhance many soil physical and chemical properties. Crop yields can be met, but it's but be sure to go out and test your manure, test your soil, and calibrate your manure spreader. Composting does reduce your volume and can greatly reduce your hauling costs. And keep in mind with that saline trial that I showed, um, shows that there might be something going on there, but because we didn't do it enough times, we can't properly run the statistics on it. We can't really say that, yes, this will absolutely work, but we think there's something there that will help improve the soil. Um, these are my worst cited. And there's my 48 inch musky I got the other day. Did you have the data for the winter at the saline soil? Yes, nothing grew. Oh, okay. So, Chris, do you think, because I mean, in that, it looked like in your high application, the compost was better than the manure, and medium application was kind of a wash between the compost and the manure application, and the low one, same thing, crop and compost. Do you think if you do the climbing, you are going to add to that salt load, and maybe? Um, not have as great effect. That, that's kind of what we think happened because with the high applications, the germination went down greatly versus the light of both were better than the medium.
And so we think maybe there's just enough organic matter there to give it a little bit of a kick. Because if we applied about 11 tons or 12 tons to the acre, well, that's about 1% of organic matter. And, and we know uh, flower pots and that sort of stuff does great just for compost. But when the soil weighs 2 million pounds, that's a lot of stuff you either got to add or subtract in order to really have a big effect on that soil. And then more so, a lasting effect. No, it flooded out. Like I said, we learned a lot about that. These are low spots that can tend to see flood out. That was 2011, I think we did that study. Um, we tested for micronutrients. I didn't talk too much about it. Soil weight plenty, sulfur, lots of calcium, magnesium, uh, SARs, 